Hey guys, it's Jimmy Bremner for CTOA and Copcast. And uh, today I have a very special guest uh, and a, a dear friend of mine, Chris May. And Chris May and I go back on the teams longer than we probably want to admit to. Uh, but we're going to talk about CBRN E today. So that's chemical, biological, rad, nuke, and explosive response. And uh, Chris is the pioneer of this in, in Canada. Uh, now, I will say for municipal police agencies uh, and provincial police agencies, of course, the federal, there is a federal response model, but it, it, uh, this all comes out of uh, 95, there was attack on the, the Tokyo subway with yes. Sarin. And this is when law, this used to be the, the, the bailiwick of, of uh, counter terror for the military. But as it started to emerge again from that attack in Tokyo in you know cities, it was clear that there had to be a more immediate response uh, to that. So law enforcement started to look at it. And then we got to 2001, the anthrax attacks in the United States That's through right. the Postal Service. And as you just informed me, that was actually prior to 9-11. And so now, the, the the police agencies are looking at a, a frontline response, and, and uh, so I'm going to hand it over to you now yeah. and uh, tell us all about it. Yeah, just to clarify that last point, Jimmy, that 9-11 happened uh, uh, in, in the States, but right. prior to that in Toronto, we had uh, a, an anthrax-related right. call, and that really was the genesis of moving towards what we now know, know as multi-agency right. response teams. So. Um, I guess that the, one of the problems that I've struggled with over the years when we're talking about CBRM and, and response is the way we train our responders right. to do it. And for a good number of years, we had the National Training Program, which was run out of which was an, ex, an excellent program for the specialists. Sure. But it neglected the, really the, the true first responders, the patrol guys that are out on the, right. out on the street. So that's almost like uh, tactical or SWAT. Yeah. Where, where when we saw the emergence of active shooter, the first people that go are frontline patrol. Exactly. SWAT's always the last to get there and has never had a successful resolution until this day. Yes. So, so that's what's key again in, in, in handing or at, at least, least educating, educating frontline, frontline patrol and this broad spectrum, spectrum of threats. Okay. Yeah, yeah, exactly. exactly. And, and, and one, one of the things we engaged in Toronto was even one step sort of below that would be to engage the communications people. Because really, if they don't identify the call in the first instance, right. then the response isn't going to be geared to what we would like it to be geared towards. Okay. In other words, nobody's going to phone in and say, oh, I have a CBRN call. If somebody <laughs> breaks into their house, they say, you know, I've, 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 right. somebody's broken into my house. They don't say we've had a B&E, but right. the dispatchers understand that it's a break right. and enter. With the CBRN stuff, it's the same thing. People are going to phone me and say, "Oh, I've just opened a letter. It's got white powder in it." And okay, okay. So, so to that point, what should the dispatcher be asking? Well, I mean, there's pretty there's simple, simple questions. There's simple questions like, "Is anybody feeling ill right now?" Is it, you know, we're looking for yeah. symptoms, right? Yeah. Uh, what kind of material are we looking at? Are we looking at liquid or a powder? If it's a powder, you know, a simple question to ask: Well, is it light and fluffy like baby sure. powder, or is it um, granular like right. sugar? The reason being is that the fluffy light stuff is more easily inhaled than something that's not. So those simple basic questions. And you can actually even get the, the, the frontline dispatchers to give them simple instructions such as, do you have a garbage bag, a garbage bin close by, empty the garbage out, just put it over the exactly. to, to prevent the spread. So very simple mitigation things in the first right. instance. Okay, so, so let's just move forward a bit. So what now? Let's talk about police officers. Yeah. And I'm responding to that. You know, it's a, a bit of a misnomer, but that white powder call. Yeah. Uh, what, what should, in terms of my safety and public safety, what should I be looking at? Well, I mean, again, it's, it's it, it sounds very rudimentary, but how many times do we see coppers running into house fires to all the time. rescues all the time? So, I mean. I think our awareness has, has been raised because of the pandemic now. Sure. So at a bare minimum, if, well, let's, let me step back a second. I think in the first instance, that those initial questions of the, we're hoping the communication Correct. staff will ask are the questions that that first responding officer should be asking. 
the key one is, is anybody symptomatic? If you've got people that are symptomatic, and when, and when we're talking about symptoms, we're not talking about people that's, you know, ha having a panic attack because they've opened this letter. We're talking about one, two, three, four, or more people all displaying similar symptoms as a result of that exposure. But if there are people that are symptomatic, you know, I would strongly recommend that our, our frontline obviously do not enter that premises, create a perimeter around it, and let the people with the proper protection equipment go in if and when they arrive on scene, i.e. your, your fire service. Sure. Um, but if there isn't, then you know, they need to protect themselves as well. So, it, and I think we're more comfortable now with the concept of wearing an, an N95 mask or a, you know, a surgical well, mask. I think one of the benefits of, of the pandemic is now the public is more conscious about their environment yes. and you know, wearing gloves, a mask, yeah. uh, you know, eyewear, uh, washing their hands. So it's actually in terms of we don't have to, you know, the police don't have to provide that educational piece anymore no. based on the last two and a half, three years. Exactly. So we're actually in a better position now yes. if uh, there was some type of anthrax threat or, you know, uh, attack yeah. or, or something like that. Yeah. So I think that's a, a, a benefit that came out of Absolutely. And, 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 and I think it's important to recognize too, as we're talking about this, that you're not going to get any immediate symptoms from a biological agent. There's an incubation period, you know, anywhere from three days to 14 days. So if somebody is exposed to it, the, the, the concept of our response is that we can identify where that material is and get you the proper medication to, to fight that disease, whatever it is that's caused. So let's talk, just talk about anthrax because yeah. typically people go into a panic about it. Yeah. But if you happen to work on a farm, yes. or if you, you were a farrier and cleaning hooves of yes. cattle and such, yeah. it's a good chance that you'll contract it. Yeah. However, there are medication. Absolutely. And people do contract it yeah, absolutely. every year. And, every year. And yeah. they get the proper medication yeah. and attention and they're fine. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I mean, I think you have to realize that for a lot of the biological agents that are out there, we do have medical countermeasures for them. But we have to identify it, exactly. and we have that, that incubation period of time to do that. So you, you're not the, the worry shouldn't be that oh well, man, I'm gonna I'm gonna die, you know, if I if I contract this. And there's the broad spectrum of biological agents that are out there, you know. And we see we're seeing intelligence now coming out to them as that perhaps the um, pandemic was instigated by what could have been a problem, perhaps. perhaps. Yeah, and it's a big perhaps. But but having said that, um, yeah, so go back to our original point there, the frontline officers, they definitely need to protect themselves going into any scene where there's a potential release of, of um, biological so, agents. So, we talk, so they're talking bio, let's talk with chemical. So, which, so if I open a jar of bleach here, yeah. right away our eyes, you yeah. already feel that? Yeah. And what, what should an individual do if they, they can, can wait, walk, walk into, into this room, room yeah. and they can, can feel something like in your eyes? Usually for me, it's, that's the first place I feel it. Yeah. And then when I, I breathe, you can feel it in the back of your throat. Yeah. So what, what should somebody do? They open that type of package. What, what would there be would their immediate response? Well, again, if they can cover it with something, right. you know, that's obviously the first thing because it's going to spread. It's going to prevent the spread of that, those vapors right. any, any further. But really, they want to remove themselves from that room. Right. Shut the door, remove themselves from the room. So bio, we're containing the individuals. Yeah. Chemical, we need them to, we move, need to move them away. From and it. if your body is reacting, that is a sign but by, by evolution that you should probably move away yeah, it, it, yeah. yeah. It, it, um yeah radiological is a bit more tricky one, yeah. yeah so um you know if it's something like season 137 that's going to be in a powdered form the same concept would right. apply cover it and uh, remove yourself if it's not then you're not going to find out i mean realistically for a, for a rad source, it would have to be incredibly strong to cause a meeting. It's very difficult to get. Very difficult to get. So, um, I think we can sort of back up from there a, a little bit and, and just focus on the, the two. Okay, we just so we've gone through the acronym. We're just going to add the explosive part onto it, and uh, really they were separate. You had CBRN, then you had explosive disposal yeah. units, and then we learned that. Small amounts of explosives can disperse a bio or a chem or a yeah. rad agent, and, and and that's where they join together and became CBRN. E. E. Yeah, correct. I, but I think most police services are, are pretty robust when it comes to dealing with your traditional suspicious packages. Sure, of course. And so, um, 
it would be kind of preaching to the converted when we're talking about how you do that. But there's a lot of similar things you can apply to the two. Time distance shielding. Time distance shielding. Right. The same applies to a, you know an explosive device right. as it does to anything to a right. CBRN device. So, so let's talk about how. If I, I'm, you know, I work in a smaller municipality, I'm a, you know, police officer, maybe I'm on a bond disposal unit, uh, maybe I'm in emergency management, but I want to, to start to build a team. How did you go about that in Toronto? Well, I, I think we were, we were fortunate in trial in that we, we had a willingness from our, from our um, the other two services, uh, fire and EMS to commit resources to. Mm -hmm. So the, if I was in a, a small municipality, the first thing I want to know is what kind of fire response do I have? Do we have a hazardous materials response? Is it local or is it a regional hazardous materials response? Uh, it could be volunteer firefighters. It could be volunteer, it could be volunteer firefighters, exactly. So what level of fire response right. do I have? Because you're going to need to understand that you may be restricted in what you can do based on the, the resources available to you. With the paramedics, um, again, we found with the paramedics, they're just a, they're applying their basic skill sets in a, just a somewhat different environment, and that's all it is. So if you have a paramedic response, all you need to do is to educate those paramedics with respect to the types of agents and the types of things we might be coming across and the signs and symptoms and the methodology of delivery of that. That's how, how tough was the bureaucracy to fight through? I mean, it's always a challenge. It's always a challenge, yeah. And uh, it will always be a challenge. Um, and, you know, I don't think things have changed globally very much in terms of um, how the three services work together. I mean, I think in Toronto, it's somewhat unique in the fact I, that... I think it's very unique, actually. I, I get an opportunity to travel to many places and see different police agencies. And uh, Toronto has probably the most robust CBRN response uh, I've seen. Yeah, and I, I think, you know, we've talked about this before, but there is certainly a, a, um, a different philosophy in response between fire police and EMS. Police and EMS traditionally work in small groups. You, know, you have a patrol car or, or an ambulance out there responding to calls, and, and the individuals work in making those decisions. Whereas fire, by the nature of the business, they tend to work in much larger groups and much more directed response. It, it only makes sense because you couldn't have you know, four fire trucks showing up to a fire scene and all doing something different. Agreed. So, yeah. so it, it, it makes sense. And I think that piece is what makes it difficult for fire to adjust to the smaller response that we're trying to get them to be engaged in. And we're thinking, you know, each service is thinking about their own areas of responsibility. And then a lot of the times when the bomb techs are going in to, to do a CBR response, they're thinking about preservation of evidence, for of course. example. Whereas when fire are guided in, they're thinking about, well, you know, we need to find out what this is. We need to know what level of protection we're going to wear to go in. And obviously the paramedics are dealing with the medical issues that are, that are there. But in, in answer to your question, um, you need to understand what resources are available to you in your immediate area. And, and you might find that we just don't have it. You know, we just don't have the resources. We need to stand up a team to do a, a response where we can mitigate and identify. But we may have the resources that would allow us to go to a scene. And if we need to do, you know, a victim extraction, for example, our fire service can put SCBA on, go into a scene and, and, you know, retract bodies and then just protect that as a crime scene. So understanding what resources are available to you would be the first step. If you do have those resources that has hazardous materials response then reaching out to the commanders that to look after the hazardous response and, and just you know opening a dialogue basically and see how receptive they would be to joining in some type of multi-agency right. response and then budgets budgets are huge i mean the cbrm work is not cheap to do i mean many years ago i got asked to speak to a, a small municipal service about this and they just got, I think, $100,000 from, from the old JET program. And we were saying, and, and they were you know, talking about all this stuff they were going to buy with this money. And that, that doesn't and, go far. And you realize that this one piece of equipment is going to cost you $50,000. And it was so deflating for them. So I think at the outset, it's very important to, to realize and understand that this type of response in terms of the equipment that you're going to need is very, very costly. So now that's said. Uh, so let's talk about the common sense approach. Yes. So again, I'm in a smaller municipality yeah. somewhere in the country. Yeah. 
and I'm, I'm thinking about the potential victims inside and yeah. my safety. Yeah. Common sense approach, what, what do I do? I get that call right now, there's a white powder in somebody's desk. That, and that's, I think that's the sort of easiest, the easier one of them to do, because we know how we can protect ourselves right. against the inhalation risk of sure. um, an airborne pathological agent. So it, again, go back to the um, COVID situation. I would certainly put some kind of protection on my hands, respiratory protection, whether it's in the form of a surgical mask or an N95. I would, I would lean towards an N95 mask. Well, let me just ask why, because some people are unaware of the difference. Oh, the, well, the N95 mask, the, the um, spacing in the pores of the mask, if you would, are, are rated down to about 0.3 microns. So a particle has to be smaller than 0 0.3, 0 0.3 microns to penetrate that mask. Most biological stuff, weapons, even weapons grade material runs from about 0.5 microns to 5 microns in size. And the N95 is more form And it's more form fitting. More protection yes. than the, the loose. Yes. I mean, ideally, you want a full face respirator. But it's, not, it's not realistic to take right. that front line. Right. Of, you're going to issue, you know, full face respirators. But, but, but again, right now, I read an article every day on fentanyl. And, yeah. and law enforcement, yeah. there is a big concern. Yeah. But the simplest, again, uh, level of protection, yeah. are gloves, your N95, some eyewear, and, some eyewear. and uh, then you're good to go. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. And you want to try and avoid as much contact with people and the material right. as you can. Now, if it is an airborne in the environment, you, as soon as you walk in there, the potential is you're going to inhale it. Right. That's the assumption you have to work under. Right. So that those basic precautions that you're taking are going to afford you a level of protection. Is it going to be definitive? No, of course not. Um, but it's going to offer you the best protection you can have given the resources you have available. So again, small city, I've responded, I've used these precautions. Yeah. I think what's important for people to understand is now you have time and you can get those resources, whether it's from a larger city near you or the RCMP yeah. at the national level. You can you can get all of that, and of course you've got your center of forensic science, you know the other labs that are out there to help identify what it is. And it, 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 well, I, I'm pretty sure the post office in the United States that had that anthrax attack is not never reopened. No, and, and they they just because of postal worker concern, and they just moved to another building. Yeah. So I'm not saying that's going to happen at every building that we're in. Yeah, but because uh, there's many reasons why they moved, um, but I think it's important to understand that you can cordon that off, and we can wait for those responses to come. To come. Yeah, and, and again, I think it's important to understand too that when we're talking about potential biological agents, that result is not going to be immediate. No. We can get a presumptive result fairly rapidly, right. but it's that's exactly what it is. It's, it's a presumptive right. result until you've taken that material to a a laboratory to have the proper and analysis. That's the, you know, the, the issue with uh, bio is that it exponentially as people travel, yes. and again, you can take that to COVID. Yes. I remember in 99, uh, there happened to be a website that tracked the spread of COVID. And I, can, I can remember watching the dots uh, on the map getting bigger and traveling to other countries yeah. as that bio agent and there was, it took a bit of time to identify it. Yeah. Turns out that it's like a SARS virus with a little bit of a difference. Yeah. And, uh, but even SARS, we saw that travel into Toronto, uh, yes. you know, fairly quickly. And I'm not mistaken, Toronto was one of the most affected yeah. uh, cities. And, and again, that is why the, the definitive analysis of a biological agent is so important because not all biological agents are transmissible persons. Oh, that's right. Anthrax, for example, is not. You, know, you can contract it, but you're not going to pass it on to somebody else. But something like plague or smallpox yes. is highly transmissible. So right. that initial identification of the product takes us down a path, but that definitive analysis is so important. And again, you know, engaging your local public health unit to manage that once it's once that's occurred, once that analysis has occurred, is critical. So let's bring us around to your passion again. It's about that frontline response. Um, getting that the knowledge in your head to the front line. It's much like me with the tactical thing. I want to get it to the front line. Uh, it, it's hard to, to download that for many reasons. But um, I, I know it, it seems like we're going backwards in time. We're trying to go to a, a large provincial model or a, you know, back to the, the national model. 
but it, again, it, it's a boots on the, on the ground approach. It has to start somewhere. So if you just speak to that for a bit. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I agree with you 100%. One of the pieces we've consistently ignored, and I don't know why, is that initial response. And, um, you know, whether we integrate it into a provincial training, you know, when the people, when the recruits are on their basic constable courses, right. or whether we do it once they're in the field, which is, becomes more difficult because of the time constraints on, on the officers, whether we offer them a, an online program where they can just get that basic knowledge. Mm -hmm. There's a number of options out there, but getting that information to them is, is absolutely critical because uh, one of my, one of, one of my, um, common remarks when I'm talking to groups like this is if it's if it's messed up at the beginning, it's going to be messed up all the way through. Yeah, so the dis, the dis, dysfunction, yeah, accumulates, yeah, for sure. So, and, you know, I'm not naive, so this is something I did, and I did it for, you know, a 10 long or 15 time. years, but I'm not naive in the sense that for the front, the typical frontline officer, this is not something they're going to be doing every day. It's not like traffic stops, it's not like it's not like oh no, we, again we have to prioritize we have to prioritize where, where it fits do. in right yeah. but just like an active shooter <clears throat> scenario which they may or may never come across right. they still need to be given the skill sets to manage that 100%. and this is the same thing you know they need to know how to protect themselves and i would often another um, comparison i would often offer is if you were going to a call for an active shooter would you go in there without wearing body armor and people are like wait you're crazy of course not well, then why would you go into an equally dangerous environment without the necessary personal protective equipment? Well, you know, again, I have to go home to my family. It's an active shooter that doesn't apply when I go home to my family. Yeah. But again, if I have chemical on me or yeah. I've, you know, contracted the transmissible biohazard and I go home to my family, well, then that's a problem. That is a problem. Exactly. So, yeah. so I, I think, you know, again, wearing that basic level of PPE. And, and having the knowledge, uh, and for me, knowledge, you know, it it's, it prevents panic. Yes. I mean, like, because people will read a news article, usually the news is, you know, structured to inflame emotions. And in crisis, that can lead to a panic. Yeah. So I think the more we educate people, even police officers, about CBRN, yes. the safer they're going to feel when they go to those calls. Yes. I, I agree 100 percent I, I mean i can remember the one of the very first calls i went to and, and it was a nightmare it was just as you say it was other chaos nobody really understood what we were dealing with yeah. and the confusion around it and it was just people that had been exposed to the material have been allowed to leave and it was just just horrible whereas if you have that knowledge it, it gives you this you know the i should say it allows you to be a lot calmer in the way you respond and you understand the potential risk of what you're what you're going into. I mean there are going to be times where I'm sure you know police officers are going to go into scenes that they shouldn't be going into. No doubt. Because it's doing it right now. It's 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 yeah. the nature of the beast, right? They're yeah. going to go in it. But as long as they understand the risk and make that decision, that's their personal decision to, to make. So um, you know and I don't want to see anybody lose their life of course because they make the wrong decision yeah. and in getting this information out there and allowing the, the officers to make an informed decision on how that response is going to occur is, is, is critical so anything before we part ways anything that you want to add or i just think that you know cbrn was the flavor of the week for a long time and it's definitely dropped off of the radar was, but down low on the radar right, now. right but it doesn't mean it's gone away no, in fact, again, I'm constantly a bit of a news junkie. So uh, I read something yesterday uh, regarding, regarding the, uh, the the war in uh, Ukraine yeah. that Russians were concerned that they're using drones to drop uh, mosquitoes <laughs> with, that yeah. are you know a vector yeah. uh, for malaria or, or or something else. So, but so again, it, it, it's it's still out there. And, and I said, as you came in, there was a news article in the States yesterday where an office, a federal government building got over 100 letters with white powder in it. So it's still out there. And, and I know Toronto, um, they probably do, I would say, two to three on, on a seven-day cycle, two to three call-outs 
uh, yeah, you know, to do those basic powders, liquids, and what have you. So it's still there. Yeah, oh, absolutely. It, it is, and we just need to educate our, our frontline responders. And if, if we can help to do that, then we're happy to do it. That's awesome. So uh, I'm just going to finish uh, RBG security. If you need security, call RBG, Hudson Supply, Lambert Less Lethal. And uh, again, Chris, thank you so much. Uh, if you have any questions regarding starting a team, uh, just contact us at CTOA and I'll put you on to Chris and he'll help you out in any way you can. That's it, CTOA, Jeremy Bremner, I'm out.